right. Are we live? Hey, everybody. <laughs> Tony, are we live? Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, I'm standing right here because I need to have this mic pick up for everybody on the YouTube channel. But welcome, everybody. Um, I write this down because every time I want to say a little bit something about the person who's presenting. This is our second of the 2017-2018 free lecture series here at Rocky Mountain School of Photography. Um, for those of you tuning in on YouTube, welcome to all of you as well. If you have any questions at all during the live stream, please type them down in the comments section down at the bottom, and we will do our best to respond to every question. Um, tonight, Jeff McLean is going to talk to us about his past architectural photography projects, the gear he uses, and some of his lighting techniques. And a little bit about Jeff is that he is a photographer, videographer, digital retoucher, and an RMSP instructor here at the school. Uh, he has worked with William Sonoma, Mountain Living Magazine, Keen Shoes, Mountain Hardware, and Robert Mondavi Wines, among others. Traveled and worked from Mexico to Hong Kong, and I'm sure, as I told you earlier, many other places that I don't know about. Um, lastly, lastly Jeff, Jeff has been a freelancer for over 15 years and takes a real world approach to his perspective of the photographic industry and the skills needed in today's market. Locally, he and his wife own and operate a boutique wedding videography business. And with all of what I just said, here's Jeff. So everybody enjoy. Hey everybody, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, as he was saying, <clears throat> I'm one of the instructors here at RMSP. Um, I'm sort of the instructor of the commercial photography component among a number of other instructors. Uh, and my main bag here is really teaching Adobe Photoshop um, and studio lighting equipment, the big powerful flash units, as well as another software program that I use a lot called the uh, Capture One Pro, which is a product by Phase One. Um, but I'll show you a little bit of the work that I've uh, worked on in the past and kind of talk about sort of this genre of photography in general. Um, <clears throat> All right, so this kind of stuff. Um, you know, shooting a lot of kitchens and uh, living rooms, great rooms, uh, bedrooms, sometimes bathrooms, um, documenting for a number of different types of clients. And in many cases, most of my clients are architects and interior designers. Um, you know, worked on a lot of catalogs in the past and a little bit of real estate here and there. Um, but this sort of work, um, it, it really employs many of the skills of a photographer. You're dealing with ambient light, you're dealing with artificial lights in that scene that you have to control the color and intensity of. You're bringing in your own lighting and, and doing it in a way, and my goal is always you know, that I'm not after trying to get uh, it to look like the photographer's work. For me, I'm sort of after trying to capture these spaces for architects and interior designers the cleanest way that I can. Um, I'm not really trying to light it in a way that's too flashy or too wild because I don't want somebody necessarily to look at it and think about the photographer. That doesn't serve my client. I want them to look at the space and look at the cabinetry and look at the countertops and look at the appliances and look at the build, basically. And that's kind of my goal when I'm working with a lot of these spaces um, is to capture it with the most you know, technical prowess I can bring to it, as well as, uh, you know, create beautiful photographs along the way. Scenes like this where, you know, this is that same kitchen but a different angle of it and really showing off this kind of unusual architecture to it. And uh, what's interesting has been that the, the cabinet maker, you know, it's such a small portion of the image, but the cabinet maker ended up licensing this image from me as well. So I've shot this for uh, Mountain Living Magazine, and it ended up kind of getting repurposed by different people. Um, they ended up paying me for different portions of it because they wanted to show off their cabinets that they built, uh, things like that. And this, you know, this scenario, I have a, a schematic of this particular lighting setup, but uh, there's quite a bit going on in this shot. I've got a light that's outside the building. Up, We're up on you know, the second story. It really felt more like a third story. This is in Lake Tahoe. Uh, an incline village, and uh, I'm blasting a strobe light in through the window, which is adding some of this sort of sunlight feel. Um, there's some light that's coming in from this window that's got a kind of a green cast, so I'm controlling some of that light. And then I'm trying to light up the whole space with really large, light, soft light sources at the same time to try to keep the shadows from getting too crazy with all these different light sources going on. 
and at the same time balancing in the existing lighting that's there, trying to get enough exposure on the lamps and the different uh, little halogen lights that are in the scene itself. These kinds of scenarios, um, you know, really documenting the spaces um, for the architects and the interior designers that are in involved. Again, this was for Mountain Living Magazine, a different residence um, in the Tahoe area. And, you know, showing off these different sorts of uh, architectural features and really a lot of it is, you know, a lot of problem solving, controlling the lighting um, with the equipment that I have. In some cases, it's additive lighting with strobe lighting or, or um, continuous lighting. And other times, it's subtractive lighting. I'm blocking out natural light that's coming in one window, letting it come in another window. I want to have a sense that the light is coming from you know, one direction as opposed to too many competing angles. And in this case, you know, with white um, furniture here that's pretty close to a door, a lot of the exposure was starting to get really bright right in here in this. And I had to control for that in order to then light up are other areas of this darker kitchen scene. Scenes like this, um, you know, taking in sort of these other vignettes of, of the living space, trying to get a feel for what it's like to live in these places. Um, and, you know, Photoshop is really one of the key tools that we use now, um, and it's not used anymore as a, we're going to fix the photo with Photoshop. As I'm shooting, I'm thinking in terms of uh, the efficiency of my process, and if I know that I can get something easier in Photoshop, I'm going to leave that for that. In some cases, a shot like this might be made up of a number of photographs that are all composited together. Um, some of the problems that were occurring in this shot were, uh, I was getting some heavy reflections on the glass that was on this painting, so I had to take a separate capture with a piece of black foam core in there in order to tone some of that down, and then I paint that in later in Photoshop. Uh, getting a number of captures to get the perfect fire, and then piecing that in with Photoshop. Um, so as I'm working, I'm thinking in terms of, you know, trying to get as much of it in one shot as I can, and then other areas that I can get much faster and piece together with the computer, then I will go for that. You know, some more urban type work. You know, this was shot in, um, down on sort of the Embarcadero area of San Francisco. And uh, this was specifically for an interior designer. Um, she had designed these spaces. A lot of these interior designers, in many cases, uh, you know, there's interior designers that do a lot of decorating. And then there's interior designers that like design and draw and build in CAD, and then they have like custom furniture made. And this stuff is like super expensive, custom built furniture, and it's kind of a different world. Uh, you're, you're working with them. It's kind of nice actually working with interior designers because they have a lot of sense of style themselves, so they work as a stylist on set with you. And they'll come in and we'll look at the shots and I'll tether to a computer so that as I'm shooting, you can see images on screen, and we work with styling it up and making it look pretty um, and working with you know the different elements to kind of create a sense of you know where you're at in this space as you would walk through it and it, honestly it's a lot of moving furniture around um, you know we're, we're constantly moving things around and manipulating um, you know moving the plant a little bit over here moving this table in so it's seen a bit we had to move this couch in a bit so that could be seen a little bit um, and that's par for the course uh, for this kind of work is that you're moving a lot of furniture around and, and bringing in props, bringing in styling elements, um, you know, those glass objects and things like that to, you know, kind of set dress the, the scene and make it feel nice and lived in. Scenes like this, you know, bringing in propping elements and, um, you know, creating little scenes like this. Uh, pretty typical of catalog type work as well where, you know, there's a lot of styling involved to create these you know, these scenes, and, um, you know, this was, this particular image was pretty challenging with all the different aspects of, uh, you know, shooting sort of in the late winter uh, along Lake Tahoe, and uh, trying to control for the amount of light that was coming in through these windows, as well as light up this dark interior scene. Uh, I use a lot of tilt-shift lenses with this work. It's pretty, uh, pretty much necessary in order to get my verticals vertical in the shot. I use the computer a little bit, but I really don't like to use the computer to fix for keystoning in my images too much. It might be like a minute amount, but I really try to get that with the camera as much as I can. 
shots like this, this particular uh, cottage that, um, well, I think I just shot this back in, I think it was May, and maybe June, early June. Um, it didn't really look like this. Um, the, we had to bring the canoe in. We had to go and get each one of these planters and bring those down in to kind of make it look a little bit nicer. Um, had to Photoshop quite a bit of the lawn because there was parts of the lawn that weren't quite finished yet. The, the house was still sort of under construction to a certain degree. But uh, the magazine I was shooting it for wanted to get it done um, so that they could you know, kind of get it into their workflow of when it was going to be published. So there's a lot of cleanup involved in, uh, with Photoshop. And uh, this sort of shot is more of a, it's not an interior, but par for the course with you know, this kind of work, you're usually asked to shoot exteriors along with it. Um, but you'll see some other images from this same, the same building. And this is more of a time of day issue. We're finding, I was constantly throughout photographing the interior of this cottage up on Flathead Lake. I was running outside a lot and like just looking with my eyes to see watching the sun and watching where the sun was going and what clouds were coming in and the quality of the light and kind of waiting for the right time of day to know when I was going to run out and shoot this particular shot. Um, and really that was uh, you know, a matter of I didn't want it to be the, the sun to be too high in the sky. I also didn't want it to be too low in the sky for this particular shot. I wanted the facade to be lit up enough you know, it's got some longest shadows, but I didn't want it to get into evening quite yet. And there were some clouds happening, so um, ended up making for, you know, a pretty nice exterior shot. This is the, you know, the sort of the foyer of this particular cottage. Um, and these sorts of shots, you know, I'm dealing with a lot of scenarios where I'm moving things around. I want there to be some foreground elements to the shot um, that kind of carry your eye through it. Um, so it's not just like, oh, dull space, set up my camera and shoot. I'm usually setting up the camera and then spending a lot of time in front of camera, moving things around and asking myself those questions, putting little items in corners just to kind of break up spaces. In this case, I have a strobe light outside the building that's shooting in and giving me this effect of sunlight coming in. Um, so lighting up the spaces with artificial lighting to, you know, to make them look nice and bright and cheerful. This is the kitchen of that particular cottage with the view out the window. So a lot of my lighting style, you know, I try to keep it really clean. I'll usually think in terms of having one sort of sunlight feeling light that's happening, usually coming from outside the building, raking in into the space. And then the rest of the light that I'm using on the interior is to kind of fill in some of the shadows at that point. And I try to keep it as simple as I can. I'll usually start with one light, get that going, get that looking good, and then I'll start building from there shot after shot on the computer um, until I've kind of dialed it in. And this one uh, didn't have a whole lot of Photoshop to it other than, which is very common, I took some extra captures that were a little bit darker just so I could Photoshop in a slightly darker scene out the window. Um, and this, you know, with the particular exposure I was working on and the time of day that we were shooting, it was very bright out those windows at that time with this exposure. So, um, and that's a very common technique as well as uh, using Photoshop to put in some other windows. And, but that's the scene out the window just with some darker captures. You know, these kinds of, this is the living room of that particular place. And in this scenario, we got a dog model in there and took a whole bunch of shots with this dog. and. Uh, and the uh, dog was great, um, very well behaved, very well trained, and got a whole bunch of shots. And then they finally kind of dialed in the one that they wanted, which was this one. And uh, you know, this this space was a little bit rougher to deal with, just because it was such a tiny space. I literally had my camera in the doorway, and I had to kind of yoga my way around the camera and the tripod in order to get in and out of the room with stuff. Um, it didn't really look like this. It looked more like this when I first came upon it. And in a lot of cases, I'm up on you know, the top story of this place up in the gable, and I, couldn't, I didn't have a stand that was tall enough to put a light outside that window. So in some cases, I just keep the light right here going out the window, shooting back in, so that I can shoot some strobe light in, get some sunlight feelings, and then I can Photoshop it out later. So you can see that you know, in the course of working with these kinds of shots, this is what I'm walking into, basically, and then pulling some books and maybe getting a glass of water and you know, working with styling some of the elements that are already there, bringing in some other props that uh, weren't there to kind of give it a, a nicer feel. Um, 
um, you know, bringing in some other little bits and putting a plant in there. It's kind of, you know, set dressing. And then lighting it up with, this was just a, you know, other than the light that's out the window, shooting a little bit of this sunlight feel in having another light just to the right of my camera. Um, so, you know, before you know it, you've got stands everywhere and you're climbing around stuff and it's, it's almost always in this line of work that where your camera's got to be is usually in some corner way back here. And in some cases, I'm shooting and I can't even look through my camera. I'm taking shots and I'm making adjustments with the camera and not able, able to get my head in between the camera and the wall. Um, but luckily I can tether to a computer and take shots and kind of get the composition and get the focus down and things like that. Again, you know, the, the sorts of scenarios where I'm in this particular shot, I'm trying to see as much of this kitchen uh, as I possibly could. And uh, I've got the two light set up where I've got one light that's outside and it's shooting in and it's raking through um, some random plants that I put in front of it just to kind of give it this dapply sort of feel. And then I've got another strobe off just on the countertop that's shooting up against the ceiling and just giving some fill light to the scene. And then from there, a lot of it is in styling. Um, in this case, I was lucky enough to have a stylist working with me, um, Jamie Holker out of San Francisco. And uh, she did a great job of you know, bringing in all, a lot of different items to kind of help what was already there in this, this residence and uh, just kind of prop it up and make it look a little more lived in. This is a, uh, one of the rare sort of real estate jobs that I'll do. Um, you know, I just did this job, I don't know, maybe a handful of months ago, and it's down in Darby. Montana for this uh, ranch and uh, this is a tough environment because of all of the dark wood these you know the sort of chunky wood Montana thing that happens here uh, you know it's it can be pretty tricky with lighting and, and this was a scenario of working with a lot of subtractive lighting behind me you'll see another shot uh, that I took from this this is the refrigerator here you can see and I actually got another shot looking the other direction of this kitchen from the refrigerator's position. But behind me, there's this just huge bank of windows and causing all kinds of reflections. You can see a little bit of in the upper right-hand corner of the refrigerator here. And so most of my lighting that I'm doing in this shot has to do with hanging huge pieces of black, either felt, in this case, I was using big pieces of foam core to block out the light that was coming in from these windows so that I'd get some, some tone. I didn't want this sort of ashy tone, I wanted this deep, darker wood tone. And so I'm actually subtracting some of the reflectivity from the windows out of the scene and then adding some of my own fill strobe light in, in places where it's not going to reflect off of this sort of reflective wood. And then from there, it's working with the exposure to get a nice warm feel out of some of these lights that are down here, it's recessed lights and then the lights above. This is the view from the other way. It's true, they had a bear in the dining room, um, you know, but you can see I'm working this, this, you know, Gable Hill goes way up, it's this huge living room, great room over here, and it's all windows. And so I'm dealing with a ton of natural light. And in this scenario, because backlighting, I would say on most photos, makes most photos look really, really good when the light is coming from generally from behind the subject. And it really works well here too, where you have the light that's coming towards camera and it's raking over things and it's giving, giving shape and three-dimensionality to the shot. Um, and, in, and again, I'm still working with a certain amount of subtractive lighting. Um, I still had huge pieces of foam core in here to try to bring some density back into the wood. I'm allowing some of it to go ashy because that's how it naturally would look if you were standing in this spot looking at those cabinets, they would reflect the windows. Um, and from there, lighting it up further. These kinds of shots, again, you know, heavily styled type shots where, you know, working again, and I think I was working with uh, Jamie Holker again on this one. Um, we were, I think, up in the Sebastopol area in Northern California. And, uh, you know, heavily styled. Um, this ranch home really didn't have a whole lot of stuff in it. And so she had to sort of bring a lot of props and, and make that happen. And she's very good at creating these little scenes to make kind of a, the vibe of that somebody lives there and these things are happening, you know, keys on the countertop and, you know, there's a little, a, you know, a scone or something there that's being eaten and, you know, little things like that that kind of make it seem like, you know, somebody was just there a second ago. 
You know, these, I, I love the one point perspective type shots. Um, I, I typically look for that when I'm, I'm shooting just because I think it's very graphic when it's just like looking straight at one wall. Um, and in this case, it was very graphic, you know, and it was very challenging at the same time, dealing with exposures outside, shooting kind of at a midday time of day, um, still shooting strobe light into the scene, which is where you're seeing the sunlight sort of look that's coming in uh, with artificial lighting and then, you know, fill light to help kind of fill in some of the architecture up above and still kind of give it a, a warm feeling where you don't feel like it's uh, being artificially lit by a bunch of equipment. But lo and behold, there's a whole bunch of equipment involved in uh, shooting this kind of stuff. You know, in something like this, I'm, I'm aiming for a certain amount of symmetry and really being particular about that. I'm up on you know, basically in front of their front door in this place. And of course, I'm like right up against the front door with my camera and, uh, you know, composing these shots. In some cases, uh, you know, fisheye lenses work pretty well, depending upon the scene that you're looking at. In this round room, I thought, what a great place for a fisheye lens. So um, I utilized it at that point. And this is just, you know, daylight shot. It was a, uh, for an interior designer and uh, she wanted a shot of this room and its architecture, so. Um, more often than not though, I, I'm not using fisheye lenses um, for this kind of work. Uh, I'll really mostly be using one lens, um, 24 tilt shift lens. And, uh, but strangely, I often still crop. I'll try to back myself up enough because I feel like 24 millimeters for me and my aesthetic still feels a little too wide to me. Um, I like a little bit more like 35 millimeters, and I have a 35 millimeter tilt shift. It's an old Canon lens that I've adapted to work on my digital camera. Um, there's a guy up in Canada that, I, that makes these mounts, and you can remove the old Canon lens mounts and put the EF Canon mount on, and it's not electronic, so you have to do everything manually. Um, and, uh, but Pretty cool. And uh, so I've, you know, 24 tilt shift and a 35 millimeter tilt shift that I'll use for, for certain shots. But more often than not, because that 24 tilt shift is so sharp, such an incredible lens that I'll try to back up and then crop in a bit so it feels more like the 35 millimeter perspective. And it gives me just a sense that things aren't too crazy wide. Um, I try to avoid those 17 millimeter lenses. Me personally, it almost takes in too much of the room and I prefer like seeing just a vignette of the space. Vignettes like this, um, you know, a lot of cases when I'm working with interior designers, they might have some piece of furniture that, uh, that they want, you know, showcased. Uh, they're wanting to see this little scene and uh, maybe put it on their website. So along with all the other shots I'm trying to get, then it's like, oh, can we get a shot of this little vignette, this little scene that I created? Okay. Um, so we do that. In this case, I'm using the tilt shift lens to throw some things out of focus um, in the shot. You know, or custom furniture shots like this where, you know, kind of designing a, a, a shot based upon, you know, the, the furniture that we're really trying to, to talk about. And this again for, you know, custom furniture interior designers. Um, in some cases, you know, the one point, two point perspective, I kind of will, will approach rooms differently where I'll, I'll kind of get off of that and kind of come at other strange angles to it. And it can kind of work. And in this case, I feel like it did. Um, this was through collaboration with the interior designer and a stylist. And we were working on this space that was kind of tricky because it was in this place that was on the Embarcadero in um, San Francisco in this sort of high rise. And... Uh, it was just kind of a tricky room with the different light coming in multiple windows and having to block light over here and let light come in another window. And we finally kind of decided like it was really feeling best in order to see the furniture and get a sense of this space as, you're, as if you're gonna be walking into this space to kind of get off axis and not be getting into the one point or two point perspective, but really kind of at this kind of strange little angle to the scene. So sometimes we'll, you know, throw a curveball in there and, and approach the spaces differently like that. Um, you can do a lot with natural light. Um, in most cases, I'm, a lot of my shots, I'm shooting with long shutter speeds. I'm using as much natural light as I can possibly get if it's a beautiful quality of light. In this case, it's just mostly lit by these 
these doors here of the light that's coming in here and just at camera pretty much so many times I find my my fill light is like right there next to my tripod and it's like right overhead and I'm like dealing with all this equipment and in this case I had to hide myself because this is a big mirror looking back at basically what would be me but I'm just outside the frame of that that mirror and then I've got this big light with an umbrella that's adding some fill light just to kind of keep the shadows from going too dark. But for the most part, it's a naturally lit shot. Natural light's really pretty. This is a shot where really sort of three clients, some of these types of shots where I, you know, initially doing it uh, through the architect, but then there's an interior designer that's interested, and then there's the builder that they had hired to like put, to build this, you know, or remodel the space, and so there's like three different clients really that are happening. Um, where the camera's sitting is on this uh, kitchen island, so I had to actually put it on this kitchen island, and they, it was hard even with a 24 millimeter lens to see this whole space, and I wanted this you know, sort of one point perspective looking in, but with the walls, and I wanted to see as much as I could so what I ended up doing is, with the shift function on the lens, I ended up shifting way off to the left and taking a shot, and then shifting way off to the right, and then stitching the two shots together. So it's a much wider shot than I could normally get. But it doesn't have that, like, 17 millimeter, you know, kind of look, which makes things kind of extra distorted, in my opinion. Um, has more of a normal lens, what you would see with your eye if you're in that space. Um, so. Again, using Photoshop to put some of this stuff together. Same situation here, they wanted to see the whole room, um, so stitching two shots together was really the way to make that happen uh, without bringing in the super ultra-wide lenses. And, and even then, you know, you can see as things get closer to camera, they get bigger. It's kind of a, just the natural uh, fact of the 24 millimeter lens or any kind of wide lens. Little vignettes running around for interior designers, and they have all these little, you know, scenes that they've created usually in spaces and uh, propping that they've thought about, and, uh, you know, so knocking off those kinds of shots as I'm there. Bathroom scenarios, here's one where my camera, I couldn't look through the camera to get this shot. It was so tight up against the wall. Um, so composing these shots and then trying to also fit a light in somewhere there, too, can be the most challenging thing for bathroom shots. There's where am I going to put my light? Because now I got mirrors, I got reflective glass, I've got windows, I've got all these areas of problem where I need to somehow fit a strobe light in here to give some fill light to the scene. But there's nowhere to put it because, you know, I'm in there. And in this case, I actually had, couldn't even be in the room to take the picture. And so I had a, my cable running underneath here and out the door and my computer is outside and I'm firing my camera from the computer in the other room. You know, bathroom scenes, you know, um, again, being able to sort of control the lighting and, and being in really tight spaces and trying to find the right angle that showcases this, this designer or architect's work is really kind of, for me, it's what I'm doing. Um, it's the name of the game for the work that I do with this, um, is I'm trying to showcase their, their work, make it look real clean. And I would say the majority is about finding the right angle and then having good props. You know, if you're photographing a space that's kind of messy, it's gonna be a photograph of a space that's kind of messy. So I spend a lot of time in front of the camera moving things around and asking the, of the client their opinion and things like that, trying to get everybody on board and then lighting up the scene. Tricky bathroom shots, you know, where you've got sunlight coming in and you've got white towels and you've got glass and you're trying not to get yourself in the shot. Um, in this scenario, tilt shift lenses can be really helpful because you can be in the reflection directly ahead of you, but you can shift yourself with the shift lens so that the lens is actually looking sort of side, sideways through the glass and you can be positioned in a way that makes it look like you're looking dead center down the room, but you're actually physically just off to the right a little bit. Things like that, little tricks that you can use so that you don't show up in reflections. Talk a little bit about some of the camera systems. Um, in the old days, this is, you know, this is what I learned on, was a 4x5 camera shooting film, um, which was you know, kind of a different 
It's a whole different deal. It's like this jalopy of a machine, you know, and you're pulling these four inch by five inch Polaroids out of it and then judging your shot before you go to film, looking at these big Polaroids and then running film and, and um, it's just a, a much lengthier process, the whole thing from, from start to finish, but really trains you to, uh, you know, look you know, really critically at the shot and all the things that you're going to change before you commit to film. Because once you go there, it's like, well, okay, the shot's done. Uh, but this kind of camera, oh, I love working with them because you have control over your rear standard. You can swing, you can shift up and down, you can tilt, and on the focal plane you can do the same. You can, you can shift, you can tilt, and you can swing. So you have control over where your focus lands, um, and it's you know, probably a larger topic for this lecture, but the concept's called Scheinflug, and uh, you can look it up, look it up on the internet, but uh, it's basically the technical, the physics behind what makes the 4x5 camera and tilt shift lenses enable you to get deeper focus in these kinds of shots. And that's why a lot of landscape photographers will use tilt shift lenses too, because they can get deeper focus from the Scheinflug effect. Uh, the trend started to move away from 4x5 cameras. Um, there's still many product photographers that use them um, for their total control, but uh, you know, it's a, it's a big thing to carry on location where you go. And so going into medium format seemed to be the move. And this was at a time when the medium format digital back, uh, you know, which are still these amazing pieces of techno technological achievement. But what's interesting is to watch the digital SLRs chip kind of catch up to that in, in its resolution, its resolving power, its color. You can go really high end, and this is sort of the hybrid of the 4x5 and medium format, where it's a medium format technical camera. So it's designed for medium format film or medium format digital backs, but it's a smaller contraption. But it has all the technical movements of a 4x5 camera, and they're beautiful pieces of equipment if you can afford them at the $10,000 for the body only. Most people are shooting with digital SLRs. Here's, you know, in this case, a mirror mirrorless camera. And, you know, the benefit of using tilt shift lenses where it allows you to keep your film plane, so to speak, the digital sensor, vertical and allowing for the vertical lines in the scene to remain vertical. Because as you start to kick back to look up at the building, it creates the keystoning effect, uh, which is not desirable in this line of work. This is some of the strobe equipment that I use, um, some of the other various gear. Typically, the light that I'll put on the outside of uh, a scene will be something very powerful, like a Profoto 2400 generator. Um, and I'll just be blasting that thing like it's the sun, just as much power as I can get, typically. Um, you know, this is the associated lamp head that, with it and reflector. Some cases, uh, utilizing Fresnel glass um, is, can be helpful as well. Um, sometimes it's like hot lights. You can use hot lights and light up a scene. You can do that. Um, if you're not having to deal with a lot of daylight, you can do that. Um, and I also use uh, Paul C. Buff's product, the Einstein. Um, I like it a lot. It's lightweight. It's pretty powerful, powerful enough. These digital sensors, you know, it used to be back in the day you'd need really high-powered equipment because you were always shooting at ISO 50 or ISO 100 film. But now you can shoot at ISO 200, ISO 400, and you know it's a pretty noiseless file on a lot of these, these digital cameras today. So it allows you to use some strobe equipment that's not quite as powerful, which is nice. And then I've had these huge cases that I carry around with me that have all kinds of different heavy-duty grip equipment, clamps of different types for different reasons, umbrellas. Um, I'll go to you know fabric stores and I'll get sheer fabric. And I'll bring that and I'll tape that to glass. If I want to take some of the brightness down that's coming in through a window, I'll just get some sheer fabric from a fabric store and I'll tape it to the glass. Um, in a lot of cases, I'll run white fabric around in the scene behind couches in different places where light can bounce up off of it and it helps to kind of clean up the color in the scene. Um, in some scenarios, I'll use this device. Um, it depends on, I'll show you some images where I, I'm using this. And this Pocket Wizard product, uh, the TT1 and the Flex TT5, were actually uh, 
I put, <clears throat> it's a little complicated in that, I have a, a cable that I run from one device into my camera, and then I have a speed light, like 430 flash, that's sitting on top of the, one of the flex units on a long pole. And I'll go out into the scene, the camera's back there, and I have another Pocket Wizard trigger in my hand, and I'll aim and I can fire the trigger, it'll fire the camera, which then fires the flash that I'm holding in my hand, and it allows me to walk around the building and paint with light. And, and fire the camera, and it's connected to a computer on a stand, and so the images are populating over there on the computer as I'm walking around this building and painting with light. And I'll show you some images that, uh, that have that. Some of the different markets uh, for this type of work. Uh, there's the catalog sort of world where you're looking at, you know, sort of the large sale shot of a particular scene, a bedroom scene, and then from that larger shot, there's the smaller cell shots of the different products. So, you know, you're utilizing a lot of the same skills of an interior photographer, architectural photographer. Um, it, but, you know, looking at more from the aesthetic point of view of selling stuff to people. Um, bars and restaurants can be an okay market as well, um, you know, for when they need this type of imagery for their own promotional purposes. Builders uh, work with a number of builders, and um, they definitely appreciate good imagery. In some cases, they're used to just taking snapshots themselves, and it's not all that great, and then they get a final product. Usually, the biggest trick I have found with working with builders is their access to the property after they've built it. Typically, the owner wants to get in there like right when it's done, and to get in there with a camera crew to get pictures of it can be tricky, unless the owners have a vested interest in those images too, which is part of, you know, selling that idea to them, like, oh, hey, you know, um, this would be good for them as well. Boats. God, I got hired to photograph the horn blower one time, and it was awful. I mean, look at that interior. <laughs> but it was cool because we got to ride around on the boat, and I'm like, hey, they're paying me to do this. But it was, just, I walk in, and I'm like, really? Like, uh, okay. Um, sorry, horn blower, but... Uh, they, they need to do a little updating to their uh, interior style, but it was it was a fun job. Interior designers and architects, you know, again they're working with uh, in many cases the kinds of interior designers that are designing and having built custom furniture. Um, those folks typically, you know, have the kinds of clients that have the kinds of budgets that will hire a photographer for photographs you know, this kind of stuff, which is custom made for this particular homeowner kind of thing. Different angles of view, you know, that you would try to get while you're there, tell different stories about who the people are that live there. Real estate, you know, it's, it's certainly a market out there. Um, just depends on the budget, you know, and, and typically uh, the bigger pro the property, the bigger the budget they might have for for uh, photography, it just depends on, you know, in a lot of cases I'm finding that a lot of real estate agents themselves, you know, are fine with just taking pictures, so it's fine too. The magazine market, you know, certainly you can walk into the grocery store and look at all the magazines that have this kind of work in them, and that's a lot of opportunity right there. Um, trickiest part of working with magazines, aside from looking very carefully at their contract, because uh, often they'll slip little things in there, like, hmm, I'm like, let's talk about that. Um, depending on how big that particular publication is, if they own a number of magazines, they might have contracts that, you know, you may not want to be giving all your rights away in that way. Um, part of the trickiest part is probably the fact that they're always operating like six months ahead of time. So if they're shooting for a winter book, it's like in the summer. So you kind of have to be working seasonally and figure out, okay, like, you know, you're almost selling ideas to them. And the times that I've had successes with magazines, it's often because I have approached them and pitched an idea to them. I have found an opportunity and pitched that idea to them. Um, the cottage that I shot up in Flathead Lake, that was for Cottage Journal, and that was a cottage that I pitched to them, the, the actual story. Like, I'll write the story and the photographs. And it was sort of like, oh, you know, great, you'll provide us with everything we need to just publish it. Um, so that, I think, with magazines is, is value added, is if you can write. 
um, and write the article. They'll probably take that article and tweak it. They'll edit it themselves. You might read it later and say, well, I didn't really write it that way. But uh, you're providing them something that they'd have to hire somebody else for otherwise. Um, so it can help you nab, nab the job, really. Building a shot. So, you know, take a look at this shot from uh, some of the earlier captures and, you know, just kind of getting a baseline exposure, dealing with exposure scenarios, dealing with, you know, having to fluff the pillows and fuzz out the, you know, the, the uh, couch here and I'm going to have to put a fire in the fireplace. I got reflectivity. I've got this weird metal building out there that I know the client's not going to want to see. Things like that. And starting to kind of dial in the exposure, get my lighting in place, starting to light it up a bit, adding in some propping. You can see one of the, somebody rolling around in the kitchen back there. And, you know, moving things around and asking questions, you know, like, oh, is this better than it was before? And uh, trying to make things look nice. Well, let's try the shawl thing or the blanket over here on the couch. You know, and uh, maybe it's not working there. Do we like having the, you know, branches in the foreground? So I, you know, in, in the process of dialing this in, knowing that my camera is not going to move, I start bringing in some of my black foam core, mainly just to give me some non-reflectivity in the glass. That's all that this is really for. So I get that plate, is what we call it, as a file that I'm going to use later in Photoshop. Um, it's a sort of movie term for that sort of thing too, where they get a capture of some kind that is going to help them in post-production. And that's what that is, it's the plate. So, you know, get some wine in there, starting to kind of get things together, getting the lighting right, watching the sun as it's going in and out of clouds and, and watching the changing of the light. And then we start getting the dog in there. And at this point, uh, you know, I kind of had dialed in for the most part, you know, my, my hero exposures, as we call them, the, the choice ones. And we bring the dog in, and I know that in post, I'm really just going to be Photoshopping just the dog into my final shot. I'm going to give my client a version without the dog, and then I'm going to give them a contact sheet full of dogs and say, which dog do you want? And then they tell me, and then I Photoshop in the, the choice dog as a, as a version for them. So we you know, get a whole bunch of different dog shots, dog doing different things. You know. Cute fella. You know, so we get it down to, this was, you know, ended up being sort of the hero shot as far as lighting. I'm not worrying anything about what's going on in the, the uh, fireplace there because I know I'm going to retouch that out. I'm not worrying about the red building out there. That's going to be taken care of later as well. So I start building it in in Photoshop. I start taking out the reflectivity. I know I need to add fire. So I get some fire into the fireplace. And then I start working on that window and stripping out. I run outside and I get a shot of a different tree and I can take that file and use that, you know, random tree file later and uh, brighten it up so it feels a little bit more like the bright exterior out there. And uh, Photoshop the dog in there, throw a crop on it, and that's their final shot. Um, that will run in the magazine. It doesn't take me too long in Photoshop. I don't know, maybe like an hour total for the shot, like if I had to boil it down in time at the computer. Um, it's, it probably took me a good four hours of on set though, getting this shot. And it was an important shot because it was the living room and it was this tiny little cottage. So it was like kitchen, living room, you know, bedroom upstairs, other little room upstairs, foyer, outside, front and back. And that was it for this particular project because it was a tiny little cottage. Um, where I came from, this is like the one shot in all of this that's not mine. Um, this is Al Kemer's shot, and um, he's a mentor of mine that I've worked for many years. And, but just to illustrate the kinds of sort of where I came from prior to getting into shooting myself was doing Photoshop for other photographers. Um, so in these sorts of scenarios, this was for Bed Bath & Beyond, um, working on a shoot with them in Miami. You know, where the art director says, oh, we have a problem because the crop shape is supposed to be kind of squarish, but our window dressing here doesn't quite fit the window casing, so then I just shorten the window casing, whoosh, shorten it down, and then the art director says, oh, can we make it a green room? Yeah, okay, so I have to make selections around everything and, and change the colors. Um, so it's, it's sort of where I got my start was in photo assisting, and then with Photoshop skills, moved into this um, job called the digital tech, 
where you're working for other photographers and managing their digital workflow and doing a lot of Photoshop on set. Um, and then I do a lot of retouching on the side for a lot of other companies and then started shooting for myself. So here's a shot where I was using those pocket wizard gizmos where I'm basically walking around the scene and lighting it up. And this is sort of like my base file shot. I get a shot generally you know, for the overall exposure of the entire scene. And I begin to light it up. And what's interesting is this lighting right here was actually the sunset that was happening. It's not artificial lighting. It just happened to be like, and I was like, ooh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep that capture because that looks nice. But you can see I start you know, dialing in different lighting. I start adding some lighting down here and adding in little lights just with a little speed light flash, painting with light, little bits of light around the building. Lighting up the front here, lighting up the gable, adding some more interesting lighting up there, lighting inside the building, stripping in a new sky. You can see here, stripping a new sky and there's a lot of retouching, getting rid of the numbers on the house and getting rid of little bits around the property. And then they ended up wanting a more sunsetty sky anyhow. So building this shot and uh, ran in Mountain Living a couple years ago. Here's another one. This was for architect, interior designer, builder, combined trio uh, in San Francisco in Diamond Heights neighborhood. You know, and this sort of thing started out where I know that, you know, I'm going to have this scene that's constant, that's going to stay there. This whole scene that's constant, that's going to stay there. But I want to add some more sunlight sort of vibe in here. I've got this little sort of bit here just to add a little bit of subtle, very subtle dappling in there. I photoshopped that in another plate out of there and start working with exposures and you can see it you know that the shadowing here is a little intense so I work with that in post-production to tone it down and get a nice sky in there and then they ended up wanting this little thing wasn't supposed to be there so we retouched that out to the final shot so it's sort of an interior from the exterior it's an interior exterior shot you know, something like this, looking at a lot of depth. You're looking at one, two, three, four rooms, really, and trying, you know, my goal in something like this is to try to get a certain sense of different tones between the rooms so that it creates a sense of depth. Sense of depth. I don't want them all to be exposed at the same tonality. I want there to be a certain sense of depth. I'm okay with the kitchen going a little darker way off in the background, even though there is some strobe back there happening. So, you know, this sort of thing I've got, you know, an F-16 type depth of field with fill light. I've got a soft box off to my left that's generally lighting this room and this foreground element. I've got another light in this dining room off in the corner bouncing up into the, the corner of the room, just filling the room with some light. Out this little window, it's like this little garden patio thing out here, um, I have another strobe that's bare bulb just to give a sense of the spherical bright sunlight that's outside the window. It was a cloudy San Francisco day. And then in the far room, I've just got a little 580 flash with a little peanut trigger on it that's sensing all the strobe pop. And it's also just kind of popping a little strobe back there, just a little bit of light so it's not totally dark back there. And, but still using a lot of, you know, whatever ambient light I can get at a half second exposure. This sort of scene, you know, I'm dealing with, you know, window off to the right here. And uh, it's pretty wild uh, color is going on in this space. You know, in this sort of thing, it's, you know, a two-light scenario. I've got a light outside the window, but one of the problems that I was having that I had to start to address is then it starts to make these tones too bright. It was just like going paper white with the strobe coming into the room. So I actually have a low black foam core card that's about eight feet long, and I've got it hanging in there and attached to some stands, so it's just kind of toning and shading some of that strobe light down on the backs of these chairs. And then just some umbrella fill. Um, this was that same property down in Derby that had uh, the bear in the kitchen or in the dining room. You know, getting up early, got up at like 6 a.m. to start setting up for this shot because I knew just looking at where the sun was going to come up, it was going to start coming up over the mountain over here. And I wanted to be able to utilize some of it however I could. Um, I didn't want it to really start to fully light this facade though. I didn't want bright sun to hit it. I really wanted to catch it at a time when it would start creating these little dapply bits for me, because I like that. And, you know, it's creating some of these little dapply bits. I've got a really 
powerful strobe off here. This is a tree, this is a tree here. Um, powerful strobe off here where there's this tree out of sight. And I'm shooting it through this tree to add some more dapple to the scene. And then I've got another umbrella just outside a frame, just shooting some fill light this direction. And uh, then I have hiding behind this, inside this room, a strobe with a grid spot on it that's shooting and lighting up this fireplace area just to kind of give it, it's starting to go a little too dark. Um, and then from there, this is you know probably a composite of, oh, and I had a, I had a strobe inside the, uh, the house as well that's lighting up the inside of this architecture. It ended up being kind of a composite of a number of shots, mainly because I was getting a lot of different, as I was getting captures, the sunlight was raking over this part of the garden and creating different layers of dappling that I really liked. So I kind of combined a little bit so you can see some light here on the, uh, the rock and you know, really just trying to, to paint with light and use these different captures and blend them together. You know, on this thing, the subtractive lighting, black foam core on a big stand, large bank of windows, and then just one light, umbrella fill. So in some scenarios, it can look really complicated, but it's pretty simple, um, you know, gear-wise. And other times, you know, it's usually the one where I think, oh, this will be an easy shot. And then it's like, oh, this one's kicking my butt. And I got like, you know, six lights on it trying to control for all these different things. And other, other ones where I'm like, ooh, this is going to be a bear. And then it's like, yeah, it's one light and some foam core. You can see in this one, we've got the, you know, Pro Photo 2400 on this stand called a Mambo Combo, which is like this 30-foot stand. It's a really tall thing, and I got tons of sandbags all over it because we're, you know, up pretty high, almost third story in this uh, Lake Tahoe home. And I need the light to go up higher than here. So the, really, the strobe is hiding behind here, and it's up really high, shooting in through this window to give some of the sense of, you know, some sunlight coming in. And to, you know, kick some light up onto the front of this, hiding by here to have a little low white card. I've got an umbrella off to the side here, just giving me some fill light. And then I've got these big panels of white foam core on either side of the camera with strobe lights shooting up at the ceiling to kind of clean up some of the light in general and fill in some of the shadows. So some scenarios, you know, you end up getting a bunch of equipment out to, to get it right because it's, you know, too much to deal with. Um, too much computer work. And I'm always, even though I uh, can do the Photoshop work, I usually, if it's a scenario of like, oh, I'll fix that in Photoshop, no, 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 I'm gonna get it right. If I can get it right with my camera and my lights right here, I would rather do that and save myself the time sitting at my computer. And I really wanna sit at my computer. Um, any questions? Uh, sometimes, there's some jobs where I have um, um, a family in San Francisco, so there's been times where I'm like, hmm, I got this job down there, I'm going to drive down, so I'll load up my vehicle and I'll drive down and I'll stay with family and, uh, you know, hang out there for a bit. And in those cases, other times, in, and even then, um, it's not that advantageous for me to haul a bunch of expensive electronic stuff other than camera and computer. Um, I'll rent equipment, um, and it's just easier that way. It's less expensive, too. Profoto, especially, is pretty expensive stuff. Um, so if I can rent it, then that uh, is a great way to go, because you can usually rent some weird specialty stuff that if you, you own it. It's like, depending on where you live and how busy you are, it's kind of weird to own that random, like the Mambo Combo 30-foot stand. Like, I don't own that thing. <laughs> you know, the... Uh, the random huge Fresnel movie cans, you rent that stuff, HMI lights and things like that. Um, you know, but like camera, computer, I'll bring a lot of, uh, like I'll have a case of, of grip gear that I bring with me, mainly because it can be, it's, it's almost like it makes me feel more secure to know that I have that stuff than to roll in and try to rent that somewhere. Be like, okay, I need to go to Ace Hardware and I need to get a bunch of A clamps. Okay, now I need to go to this store and get these three different clamps. Oh, they don't have that one. Okay, how am I gonna rig that thing that I wanna do now? But if I know I've got it in my Pelican case, I can bring it. It's like a super heavy case and I stick that. And, um, I've checked that thing on the plane and have to pay extra for it. But I know that I have it and I don't have to rent some of those little things that might be more difficult to try to source. But uh, other stuff like lighting, you know, if, if I can find a rental place 
where I'm going, then that's all I'll do it. There's been times I've worked on jobs where we go to like Mexico and we're going to places where you can't rent anything. So you check it all on the plane. I, you know, one guy that I worked with for many years, we would go and you know travel with them to Mexico, Mexico a couple times, and it's like 15 cases of gear we're checking, and like you know paying the sky hop some extra cash to help us go through business class check in, you know, like trying to work little deals to try to like get these multiple carts of equipment onto the plane. Uh, because if you try to take it to another country, you have to fill out what's called a carnet. So that it's like a list that you fill out of every single thing that you're bringing to that country and you take it to your customs agent in the United States and have them stamp it. And then when you get to the other side, you show them, they go through it all, they stamp it. And then when you go to leave at the end of the trip, you got to go through the same process. So they make sure you didn't sell anything or take anything on while you're there. So it can be kind of a pain. And that's what, you know, often if we're, you know, if I'm you know, going overseas or whatever, going to a place that you can drive to, if you can get it on the trucks that are taking merch there, then that can be great. But then that puts the onus on them. If they decide to confiscate your stuff, you know, then it's not on, they're like, well, it's not our stuff, it's the photographer's stuff. So, you know, it can be, it can be tricky traveling with that kind of stuff, but take what you can take, and if you can rent, try to rent the rest, especially the heavy equipment, sea stands, sandbags, apple boxes, uh, big lighting equipment, all that stuff you can rent. But like little clamps and other little doodads that you might need, or like specialty stuff like cinefoil, stuff like that, can be kind of tricky to, to locate at, at certain rental shops, so it's, it's better to just like put it in a case and check it on the plane or you know, put it in your car and take it with you. Any other questions? Sure. I need that microphone. <laughs> I want to say everybody, thank you for coming. Happy holidays. Also, if anybody wants to come in to any of the other ones, here's all the information on the next ones coming up or obviously rmsp.com. So Merry Christmas, happy holidays to everybody. Thanks yeah. for coming. Thanks thank for coming you out. On YouTube. Thank you. I took so much out of that. I've never heard you talk.